towns and cities. Um, over the years, that for different uh, events, symposia, we've tried to get Louis here. Uh, and I'm glad that we're finally able to do so on the occasion of the Auto Drives Architecture Research Project, uh, the Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment's contribution to a forthcoming exhibition opening in spring of 2020. Um, this is also coinciding with our two-week master class entitled um, the, uh, the Archit Architecture by Auto, uh, where our students have been reimagining uh, 12 building types according to the future car. Louis Vermeesh is the founder of Grand Studio, a mobility research and design studio based in Turin. After holding the position of design director at Pini Farina, he expanded his expertise beyond the car and into the broader field of mobility. Grand Studio brings together a unique combination of expertise, including car design, architecture, engineering, urban design, and management. This unique combination of vision and expertise allows the studio to design future mobility means from cars and vehicles to services and policies. At any rate, it's a pleasure to uh, give the podium, uh, it's nice to say that again, uh, uh, in live to Louis. Thank you very much, and we look forward to the lecture. Thank you. As was mentioned, I studied industrial uh, design here in, um, in Delft, and then a uh, big part of my career so far was also designing cars. But as you will notice, I have a particular passion for where that discipline overlaps with architecture and urban design. I think that's where uh, we should focus on, where things should happen. So I'm always happy to confront some of the ideas we have with people like uh, you. And uh, I also look forward to have hopefully some, uh, some discussion and dialogue on it. The title uh, was, the words on the title were Cars and Architecture, but I will start from cars myself so I can contextualize a bit. So I started here, I'm from Belgium. I started here in, uh, in Delft. And I did my thesis project already in Italy with Pininfarina. Uh, Pininfarina was one of the traditional design houses. Um, I started there as an as a intern in maybe typical Italian fashion. The last hour after six months of internship, they offered me a job. And, um, and I grew in the company until in 2007 I became design director. That means that so I was overseeing all the design of Pininfarina, including also design of uh, you know, the famous brands like Ferrari and Maserati and so forth. Now, after that, you know, for me, a fantastic cycle, uh, I decided to start my own uh, design agency. Uh, we also do some uh, research. Because uh, for me, it was really essential that I could go beyond just the, the vehicle. So it was a very natural thing, uh, because I think interesting things happen when, uh, on the one hand, we keep designing vehicles. That's a know-how that we keep in the studio. But we also look at the broader scale of mobility. And I think the two are necessary, because if you design cars without, or vehicles without understanding you know, the broader context of the future, it's less likely that they will be fit for that future. But the other way around, as I uh, will show, is that I think also when we work on urban design, for example, we should watch out that we don't make urban plannings which are just based on the existing vehicles of today, or worse, some of the fake vehicles on uh, maybe internet. So. I really like the intersection uh, between the two. So that's why we say that what we do means can also be strategies, means can be uh, services and, uh, and so forth. And what I took from my experience in Pinafrin, which is really like hardcore car design in a way, there's two elements that I took with me basically, which till today for me are uh, essential and important when we look also at the broader field of, uh, of mobility. And one is, uh, oops, 
One is um, understanding, and maybe it's also something I picked up really in Italy, understanding how small a detail can be, but how can you work on the millimeter of attention of the line, thousands of these elements together create an emotional uh, reaction. And I think that's relevant because essentially what we want to do is through design also change human behavior for the better. And we all know that human behavior is very much emotional driven. So that's an element uh, that human approach, but understanding how much our behavior is influenced by small, small details as something that I uh, keep uh, with me. And uh, another thing is, when you design Ferraris, you can look at it different ways. You, know, you can see it as uh, ones I was driving in, one not mine, of course, and uh, a guy in bicycle was passing by, and in Italian he was shouting, it's nice, eh? capitalism. So there's that side to look at it. But there's also the way I like to look at it is that through sports car design, and I'll jump this and go straight to an example. This is a sports car design with, with my studio. That true sports car design is essentially about designing in symbiosis with the forces of nature. Because this is the Lara Stradale. This is a road-going car. You can buy it, you can uh, drive it. The essence of it is that there's no car on the road today which is more simple than this, more effective than this, and lighter than this. So this is essentially an extreme exercise in designing efficiency. Efficiency in this case for the, the air flows and also the weight. This car is only weighing 800 kilos, um, which is uh, very light. And as you will see later, what true sustainable design is. And maybe it sounds strange to use the word sustainable with this image behind me, but sustainability in design is also, not only of course, but also a lot about dealing with uh, materials, with matter in a very efficient way and moving without using too much energies. Now those principles are present in these type of cars and that's the interest I really have in them, is designing the ins and outs, and basically my studio is defining everything you see with the naked eye without unmounting pieces of the car. So all the panels which go outside and inside, we define that, working in close collaboration with engineering companies which then engineer everything that sits under it. For this lecture, I didn't put in so much car stuff beyond uh, these, uh, if some of you are really interested, want to know how a car is designed, at the end I have some slides on how a project like this is designed. So if somebody's interested in that, just at the end, raise your hand. But let's move a little bit more closer to the subject. When we talk about cars and architecture, one of the elements that's coming up is that the autonomous driving is changing what the car is. It becomes not only a tool to drive, but also becomes a place where you reside. So from the driving to the residing. Now we do research uh, to that from how some effects of the loss, but what it means for, for interiors. Um, we're studying interiors that are becoming increasingly flexible, where people can do uh, different things in it, uh, address different needs in different moments of the time. And this is an aspect that is uh, happening, is going on, even though I'm not a follower of these, I sometimes think, rather totalitarian visions that suddenly all the cars will be autonomous. It's not going to happen. Uh, I th also think maybe our uh, uh, door and basically are surrounded by, by robots. But where it will happen is, for example, on the highway. The highway is anyhow a place which is only for, for the car. Now, very soon, cars will go 
by themselves on the highway. Uh, countries like Belgium and Holland are quite compact countries, but already in Italy, you, it's very easy that you take the car and drive for three hours on the highway going from Torino to Firenze, in my case. So in those situations, there will be the aspect that cars do be partially become living spaces. And um, this is uh, resulting, for example, in designs which uh, tend to become designs that look more also to how we organize our spaces in the house. So um, a car traditionally is designed that everything is on one place and everything is designed to the extreme that it tells you what to do and where to push. Now, one of the things which is happening is that, as you already noticed, buttons are disappearing and in that space of the car, just like in your home, you're enabled to do more or less what you want, the furniture around of a car, but definitely there will be more flexibility. But of course, one of the problems with this, that everything I said now, is still just focusing on the object, on the vehicle, um, probably based also on the desires of the, of the people. And, but I think what really needs to be done urgently is that we look more also on which needs are coming in from outside. Now, the most obvious one, of course, is sustainability. And I'll give a last uh, car example of a car that I designed uh, with my studio, which you might know because it's a Dutch car, uh, the Lightyear one. So it's the solar car which is being built in uh, Eindhoven, which will come out in uh, limited production uh, next year. And this is designing vehicles which take more into account the needs of our context, of our environment. Uh, in this case, it's a car with um, uh, integrated, uh, meaning that the car energy, uh, clean energy, of course, but the real key of it is that the car is designed in an extremely efficient way. And it is here that the know-how of cars like the Dallara, the yellow car I showed before, is to see it in the extremely aerodynamic shapes. Aerodynamic shapes means using less energy, so that with the energy that you generate through the solar cells, you can go uh, farther, and the car becomes really uh, usable. This is definitely what we need to do with cars. We need to make them more uh, efficient, um, more flexible, more uh, sustainable going forward. But I think it gets really interesting when we go beyond the car, because I think we are in a very interesting moment where technologies are enabling things we couldn't do before. So now we are still in the phase where basically everything we knew until now, we make it electric. You know, we take a car, we make it electric. We make a bus, we make it electric. We make a bicycle, we make an electric one. That's great. But we can do more. And the more, I think, comes from when we design, we don't start from the object anymore. I think the flexibility of the new technologies gives us the freedom to literally start more with a white sheet of paper and for each context look which type of vehicle, which type of surface is creating the right balance between the individual desires that we all have, each one of us has them, and let's say the more collective needs. And the important thing here is that we need to start to look, that's my opinion, in car design to more context-related vehicles. I always look with, uh, to be honest, with a certain um, jalousie, uh, in the English word, to what you, you do, because often you make a building for a specific context, and you study the context, and you you look how that building, how it works, is really fit for the context. Now, it's totally opposite of how, let's say, for example, an SUV 
is designed. We design literally an SUV in a white room, and it has to kind of work everywhere all the time. So it's like the perfect Swiss knife on wheels. But in this moment of time, partially because of the needs we have in our society, but also partially because the new flexibility that technology is giving, I think what we need to do now is design vehicles, mobility services, which are more context-related. So not designing one vehicle anymore that we think needs to do everything everywhere. But I mentioned before, the car on the highway, of course, will still be a very good solution. But it's obvious that the car in our inner cities is just out of place. It's, it's not the right context for the vehicle to be used there. So that's what we also do in the studio. So use the know-how that we have of vehicle design, because I'm only interested in ideas, visions that can make it to reality. Because otherwise, you kind of design for Hollywood. But I think the real intention should always be to influence reality. So what we do is use that know-how to um, work in a different way, start from the context, how we want people to move in that context, and then look which service, which vehicle could enable that. And let me give you a couple of examples to make that more uh, concrete. The first example is a project of mobile objects. The name says itself, this is no longer a car. A Mobiect, um, literally, the project originated out of a project we were doing, the picture you were seeing here, is that we were working in a city in Belgium where we had to design a new mobility uh, plan. And we came to the realization that there was a situation where there was distances about seven, 800 meters, which are a little bit too far to walk, especially because it was a lot of elder people, because there was a hospital, a lot of people with bags, because there was a shopping center, and so forth. And that made us realize that actually this is going on in many places where the distances we need to walk are too far because a big part of our society, our cities, is already built around the scale of the car. So it's a good thing, of course, to take away the car out of our cities. But in some cases, like the one you see here on the picture, we are a little bit out of a human scale. It's not so pleasant to, uh, to walk there. And this is definitely true when we look in cities like in China, which are huge, and where walking distances uh, often become way too long. So we started uh, working on a project that we wanted to enable pedestrians to move further uh, the beautiful shape, which then manifests itself in the context. No, we immediately designed it in the context. In this case, we didn't want that the vehicle took away the quality of pedestrian, so we designed it in a kind of mimetic way. And it was also about finding different ways of moving. Not always we need to go from A to B in the fastest way possible. For example, on a Sunday, this sketch was made with the Champs-Élysées in, uh, in our mind, which on Sunday is sometimes closed. Sometimes they can be in situations a quality of movement when it's more slower or more wandering. So not a vehicle that is designed uh, for speed. The vehicle that came out of it almost looks like a bus stop which is moving, uh, engineered it. And this is the kind of autonomous technology uh, that I think is suitable to use. This is not about level five autonomy. This is about vehicles which go very slow, not more than 12 kilometers an hour, blend in, are really open, you can hop in, uh, hop out, and um, you can jump on them even just for a couple of hundred meters to, to go with them uh, and extend that quality of the pedestrian area. So here you see in this image literally the mimetic uh, design. In the roof, and so you see now how of car design coming in. In the roof, there are solar cells integrated, which means this vehicle, of course, is consuming very little energy. So 
just the solar roof is plenty enough so they're free to move around. We always also wanted that the usage, and I will get to that uh, more really important, that the use of mobility means is fluid, low threshold, and so forth. So, of course, we didn't want that you had to make tickets or even scan something with your, with your phone. So we <coughs> turned around the concept of basically raising the value of the advertisement because it's more targeted to what uh, they know about you. So here we did a geo-based advertisement. It's an advertisement which is related to the context, hence also increasing the value of it. And that would be the business model behind it, which makes it, for the rest, free to use. <coughs> and extremely important, and contrary to a car, we did not want that when the vehicle was standing still, it's something strange, because it's designed for speed. So it's a vehicle which is also a smart furniture, if you want to call it like that. When it's standing still, it becomes a meeting place. It also becomes a last and the vehicle together. A second example is, we call it cyclomatic. We are still uh, uh, working on in uh, the northern part of, part of Belgium where there was a lot of mines. And between the mines, they had these railroads just to move uh, the carbon uh, between the, the mines. And we're doing a project there to look how we can increase the mobility, but also diversify the mobility in that region, which is now extremely car uh, dependent. And of course, we looked into uh, possibilities to use more the bicycle. But as you can see on this picture, the stretches between the villages, between the interest points, are rather far. There are sometimes long, long lines of about 15, 20 uh, kilometers. And research showed that that is sometimes a limit for people, because it's not pleasant, especially in the weather when it was, uh, would be rainy and cold, even considering electric bicycle. Maybe not for the young people, but again here, the elderly is, I think, a group we really need to take into account when you think about inclusive solutions. So what we did here, a bit the same principle as you said, saw before. In a way, these are also kind of mobics, vehicles that you hardly see when they, uh, they're integrated. So what you can see here is on the left is actually the station. And on the right, a little bit farther away, is the vehicle. And the station and the vehicle are designed literally in the same way. Inside the vehicle, we have the same tarmac as a street, so not to create borders between the two. And we think it's extremely important. So basically, what you can do is um, you arrive, you uh, go in with your uh, bicycle, and you can decide to shorten some stretches. In the same way that was when you're on the... Uh, so you can shorten a bit the stretches. So, and um, that's the vehicle is doing that, again, to enable the bicycle use. So not to create an alternative, but to enable it to make it. A third example is uh, Project Comma, for which we're working, and we're also involved in the startup itself. And uh, it's a project that I can't fully reveal to talk about because I think it's really connecting to architecture later on. Comma is addressing, of course, sustainability, of course, electric vehicle, but also uh, congestions. We always so know in our cities. And congestion is also simply telling us that it's just not going to be enough to make all cars electric. You know, if you just keep driving with two tons of metal and battery around us, certain solutions won't come. And I also think from a sustainability point of view, it's not enough to just be electric, I think. I think we also need to look at use less means, less material. Here you see the performance thought coming in which make that we use less energy. Because today we only talk about that electric cars are clean, but we do need to look at the full picture. 
And if you look at the full picture, what it takes to produce a battery, so you start in Africa with the mining. Mining is not done with electric vehicles, it's with heavy polluting trucks. Then the, everything goes on to extremely heavily polluting uh, boats. And then you have the whole process and so forth. When, taken in, when you look at the full picture, then I think we need to do more than just electrify. Now, not wider than a motorcycle, than a scooter. And two people can sit uh, behind each other. And the, uh, there's a tilting system in it. So you, uh, it's very stable because in the corners it's moving with you. It's a very natural way of using it. And of course, the thought behind that is that on the one hand, if you, use, if you buy it, you will have uh, the possibility to f go more easily through the traffic, less congestion. On the other hand, uh, you use less uh, energy. But what really interests me in a project like this is that contrary to a car for a city, if we think about that many people would Using to a worsening of the situation, it actually has the potential to improve the context. Because if many people would adopt it, of course, at least in certain areas, not everywhere, but at least in certain areas, uh, reduce the space given to our vehicles and increase the quality of the public space. And that is how much cars you can park, for example, in a, in a building block. If you would use vehicles like this, you can uh, uh, park four times as much uh, cars. And if you combine it with a sharing program, that would mean that you can have, uh, everybody could have access to a vehicle. And this is related, and I'm sure you know more about it than me, about new regulations where you can no longer just build as many uh, parking places as you Conclusion of this first part where, so for me it's very important that V focusing on existing archetypes, but using the new uh, possibilities with more sensibility towards the context, and each time look what is the right type of vehicle in the context. And so I see mobility where it's in the future not just about cars, and trains and bicycles, those of course will stay, but many more things. And I think this is important when you work on plans for the future to be aware of that. Don't just act into your plans for the future because what you risk to do then is literally cement the past into the future. There will be many opportunities, possibilities. So I think good plans enable that, anticipate that. But of course, until now, we talked about vehicle design, whether it's a car or a more broader approach as a pro, but still really vehicle design. Now we need to make a next step into the real mobility design. For me, mobility design is the design of how we move people, but also goods. And of course, mobility design is no longer strictly linked to one type of vehicle. There are still people, and there will be still people in the future that do everything by uh, one type of uh, vehicle, the car or the bicycle. But each one of us is more and more having a multimodal mobility behavior. When I came here to the, in the train, I saw that uh, NS was making publicity about their multimodal uh, offering, which is a, a change already from 10 years ago. And I think this part should be of particular interest to you. Because if we look, not just at, if we don't approach it from the object, from the vehicle, even if it's context related, but we look, you follow the people. In this case, to focus on people, not on goods. You follow people. Of course, what's happened is that mobility design is not just about designing vehicles or the app that allows you to use it, but you will also move through architecture, through urban design and so forth. That's an essential part to me of the mobility experience. 
And actually, so if we want to make the complete picture, so in the vert, if we really talk about mobility, in the vertical columns, we should not just put vehicles, but also those infrastructural parts, whether it's your home or uh, the station and so forth. And when you analyze it, what's going on today, and I think I have to say Holland is doing a very good job on that, but in many countries it's, it's worse. And what you see is that often the experience falls apart in the in-betweens. You know, there's a lot of attention on designing good vehicles, good trains, good buses, the quality is improving, the comfort is improving. Let's check. Okay. Architects like you are, of course, focusing a lot on the quality of the living in our building or working in buildings like that. But when you look in kind of the rest spaces in between, there it often falls apart. An example, you arrive at the airport, maybe you've even flown business, everything is taken care of you, and there's many airports where when you have to pick up your rental car, suddenly you find yourself outside under the rain or in a cellar or this and that. Now, now I'll connect back to what I said in the beginning, is that the human behavior, our human emotion, is extremely dependent on details. And it's often those details that make us not behave in the way we should behave in this multimodal way. And I think there's a big task there, and I think that is where the vehicle design, architecture, urban design really need to come together. If we do that, then we can create a mobility experience which has a quality throughout. And if we create to improve the behavior of uh, people in a society, is simply offering a service, an experience, which is better than what you did before. I think that's the only way. We are not living in societies where we can oblige people to do a certain thing. It should be because things are improving, and then we can, in a way, use a network effect. If we do that using, as I said, vehicles, which then actually can have a positive interest of changing also the bigger, better picture for the better. Now, let's go back to that last vehicle that I showed, the comma, and show that uh, relation. We are currently uh, on a project in, uh, in London, and uh, it's for uh, new buildings which sit a little bit outside the center, as you can see, a uh, bit on the, on the edge, in the, the Greenwich area. And it's an area from which you can have different needs. Sometimes maybe close to your place, sometimes you have to go to the center, but you also have the occasional trip outside, maybe for work or just even a weekend trip when you go to the site. Now, those different needs are needs of the people that live in those buildings. And so what we are working on is creating a multimodal mobility service which is integrated in the building itself. So you don't buy a parking place, you don't buy a car. You buy an apartment with the mobility service integrated just like your heating is integrated. And of course, to do that, there must be huge attention to the user experience because this is what I mentioned before, where we have, need to have, I think, extreme attention to make sure that the behavior that you ask from people is, we call it, zero threshold. Compare it a bit with when you download an app and the app is asking you too much steps and registration, it's not fun anymore. You know, we live in a kind of one swipe, one click kind of behavior. Now, the same, I'm not saying the same, need to uh, create in the mobility services that we offer. And that's why in designing this, 
I think we need to take that human perspective. We do it by creating what we call user journeys. It's a, it's a common method in, uh, in user experience design. And the good thing of it is that you literally follow the people almost. So you can see we sometimes do it with, uh, with cartoons. And designing step for step what people do problems. And those are the ones that you also want to keep an eye on. And for example, when we analyzed those, uh, some of those buildings that were foreseen in that area, it was incredibly, you had a lot of barriers just to get your bicycle. And it was just not looked at. So look how many doors from these strong swinging doors you need to pass just to get your bicycle and get out again. Now this is affecting the way, uh, how much you will use your bicycle. So we're working on changing the design. Sometimes it's simple interventions so that the experience of it becomes really uh, fluid. And that goes, of course, reducing the doors, sliding doors and so forth, but it goes all the way to the charging points which is the right thing, attention for the kids when you have to put them on the bike. The type of approach is now integrated in the new design of the buildings and it's really changing. Until now, often it was just you know, the garage, the parking place, just, just fill it up, make sure we have enough things. Now it's being designed in a totally different way. One in a way that it can have many types of vehicles, so in this case, uh, legislation only allowed to have one parking place for each 10 apartments but through the use of vehicles like comma we can have enough vehicles for everybody so it's a mix of vehicles like comma normal cars bicycles and we set up a, a scheme of what these vehicles are shared but within uh, within the building so giving access with the same space giving access to mobility for everybody living there. Another example of this, uh, how I think mobility and thinking about mobility can and should change also the way we build, the way we uh, create our architecture, is a project we did for Ghent. Ghent is another Belgian city. And Ghent has this tip. Do you wrong? Okay. Has this typical 70s solution, you know, with a highway coming right into the city. And so we developed a plan to literally cut the highway and make a multi-hub, so a hub where you can park, but not only park, and where you can switch between the car and uh, vehicles that bring you in the uh, city. And again, the same here. We went great lengths to make sure that the experience of switching that vehicle there is much, much better than the experience of having to find a parking place, because only in that way it will help. And of course, in projects like that, you need to take into account that parking place of the future will not be the same anymore as today, because quite soon you will have parking place with only electric vehicles, so suddenly you don't have the gases in those buildings anymore. I think that makes them easier to be, have multiple uses in it. Uh, we anticipate that less cars will be used in the future, so the grid is designed in such a way that you can easily convert spaces the moment you have less cars sitting in them. And then there was all other things around, of course, charging, uh, having DHL or Amazon delivering your package in your vehicle while you're in your office, and uh, so forth. And the last one, who's for me showing your scale, the last one is a project we are still uh, working on. Uh, and you can note some coming from Belgium, because it's also for a Belgian city. Uh, Liège, the capital of Wallonia. And we're working together with uh, UAC uh, from Paris. Let's check. check. Okay, let's check. Like that. It's an example of um, when you make these future plans.
right. For me, it's, it's a small example of and a very kind of not far in the future, but basically today, but how new vehicles, new types of vehicles should change the way we look also at urban planning. So here's some slides from uh, the project. Now, what you see here is an analysis of the slopes. So red is slopes which are more than six degrees. Now, six degrees is the angle which you can consider still comfortable to do with a normal bicycle. And uh, not by coincidence, when you overlay the bicycle paths, you see, of course, that they basically avoid all the red parts. And the same goes, of course, for the trains and the buses. And it's only the car, then, that uh, did not have that limitation of the um, rapidity, I'm too Italian, of, the, of basically how steep the slopes are. So it's a typical city where the flow of the traffic is flow, following the flow of the river because the river, this is almost all the axis of the city were moving uh, like that. Of course, except for the car. But this study is, as many studies for cities, is look how we can also create a more different use of vehicles. Now, what we did is saying, yes, but if we need to look into the future, I mean, even I think in five, ten years from now, basically all bicycles will be electric bicycles. And not only that, uh, I didn't want to bore you with too much examples, but there will be many different types of vehicles which sit in between the bike and the motorcycle, covered, not covered, and so forth. That, so that will be a whole range of vehicles sitting there. Now, for those vehicles, also for the electric bike, having a slope of 10 of 12% is still very comfortable, still very doable. So this shows you which areas of the city are more steep than the, tw the 10 percent. And so literally, it frees up a lot of space that we can consider for biking lanes. And we analyzed where exactly those uh, can uh, pass. And so we're developing uh, an idea whereby it's not only the traffic flowing basically in the river, but overlaying that with a paths for bicycles and extremely light vehicles, which is literally crossing that. So creating a new type of opportunity, connecting a network which is no longer stuck in the, in the valley. And the idea is to literally um, make these streets very green. So it's as if the green of the hills which is surrounding the uh, city is flowing back into the city. So it's a small example of how the use of a new technology, a very simple one in this case, can have also big effects on how we conceive uh, urban designs. So imagine what it means when we look into possibilities of 20 to 30 years uh, from now. I think that's important because whatever infrastructure you will design, will still be there in 30, 50 years from now. If you design a tram in your project, it takes 30 years to pay for that tram. So maybe instead of designing a tram, maybe it's better to design a dedicated lane, a good quality lane for um, a good uh, comfort, but which enables that in 10, 20, 30 years from now, you use a whole range of vehicles uh, which will be coming on dedicated lanes. You will be able to do some autonomous vehicles. You can do micro cargo in the night and so forth and so forth. So not extrapolating just what we see today into the future, but and that was that first slide I showed, but start from looking well what will be available. And of course, don't do technology push, but look if those technologies can enable the desires that we all have of living 
in good cities. And I want to conclude that this zoom out from basically the cars to mobility prematurely share some things we're working on with the University of Delft, by the way. There's a mobility jam uh, participating, and it's an initiative that will have an event next year in, uh, in June, and in which the relation between mobility and society is really investigated. And it's showed some small examples from that. But if we really zoom out, not just in scale, but also in time, and you go to study, you will discuss influenced, if not in many cases, almost a consequences of mobility. Now, I'm sure we, all, for example, the Roman Empire, I'm sure we all uh, read about Caesar and Brutus and all these things. At how much mobility really defined and enabled to have such a big empire. The roads are a part of that, but don't forget in those times, the fastest way and the safest way to travel was by sea. The oceans were still too big and too wild to dominate. The boats at that time were good enough for the Mediterranean Sea. So that's why you had first cultures around the Mediterranean Sea. The Egypts were just staying on the Nile. Rome, bigger boats, they stole them from Carthage, Carthage, but bigger boats who could do the whole Mediterranean Sea and could bring enough food to Rome. That's why it could also grow so much. But there's also another thing of mobility, moras, you know, the wet area. And to drain the water, they had built channels. So in a way, they had suddenly uh, draining pipes, which was draining away all the dirt from the city. It was extremely important because otherwise you got diseases in the cities which are limiting the size of the city. So this is an example where mobility is really a big part of what could happen. And of course, it's also a military side to it. We're using the roads and the boats. But uh, mobility as an underlying force, I think, is shaping much more our society than we actually think of it. Another small one, this is a map of North America, the Great Lakes, and you can see at the bottom right corner, New York. Now, New York, in between Europe and the heartlands of the United States, but it really boomed when they made the Erie Canal. And the Erie Canal was connecting the Hudson River, which is going vertical, with the Great Lakes. And so suddenly, because again, water transport was the main transport in those times. You can imagine we have seen many Western movies of how dangerous it was to just go by carriage. So suddenly, New York was at a terminal of a huge area and of course could move those goods easily to New York, so to Europe with the Nord Stream. So you often you will see that societies really got success when they were somewhere in the middle of a stream, of a flow of, of mobility. The last example to point it out, London. If you study London, I won't go too much in detail, but I can really recommend a lecture of Carolyn Steele that you can find on YouTube. And she's explaining how she takes it from the food angle, but in a way she's also talking about mobility, how the mobility of food was shaping London. A small example. Those times, of course, there was no refrigerators. That was meaning that if you had milk after a couple of days, the milk was sore. It's dangerous to, to drink it because we couldn't uh, cook it yet and so forth. Now, what is the consequence of that? That people were keeping the animals close to them because then the transport between that food and the people was short, hence fast enough to still use the goods. When the trains came, suddenly, it was, you could go very fast in and out of the city, 
So you could take milk from the cows much farther away, which really helped to change the city because then you did not need animals inside the city anymore, less diseases, more grow, and so forth. So if you analyze uh, not only history but also today, you will many times see that mobility, in that case the train, played an incredible big role. And you can see it even in the naming of the streets and so forth. So last slide to conclude. This is a slide of the mobility. Uh, this is that is saying that, first of all, everything is movement. Now, we don't realize it, but the bench on which you sit is in movement. You don't see it because the atoms, we can't see it with our naked eye, but they're in movement. But also, the continent on which we live is in movement. But we don't see it because it's over such a big times that we will never perceive it. But we're, what we see as static is just because we can't see the movement of it. But everything is movement. Now, within that, I think the nice definition that Peter Addy gave is that movement with intention, movement that has meaning, that's mobility. The hypothesis is that that mobility is really one of the forces shaping society, and of course, not only that. And it's enough to uh, have the picture in front of you that I think all cities originated next to roads, whether it was water roads or later on, for example, United States, the roads uh, for, for cars or uh, other vehicles. And I think it's a very interesting subject to look at, because if that is true, then it means that there's a really potential in designing and thinking of our mobility in a certain way can have really an impact on society in a much broader way than just talking about the styling of one vehicle or the color of it. And that's why I'm so fascinated by the subject and I'm so fascinated how this huge scale of on which things happen, if you really look at it, then are often decided by these very small details which influence our behavior. Thank you. So, whoever has remarks, agrees, doesn't agree, please. And, and so, and I think if you're interested, but I prefer to have the subject, I think, more in relation to what you do. Thank you, Loie, for uh, showing me, us your work. Uh, there's other students from the Berlag as well have questions after me, but I'll kick off with the first one. Um, maybe a very uh, a childish question uh, directly. I mean, you mentioned today you took the train to come here to Delft. Mm -hmm. um, what else do you drive? <laughs> and why? Maybe that's the most important question. Is in Turin. And for family reasons, I, with my family, I live at hundreds of kilometers. So it means that I'm three nights in Torino, and I move in between, uh, or with the train or with the car, depending on uh, what I need. The, in the city, I always use the bicycle. Um, the car I drive is... Um, not what people expect from a Ferrari designer is a Volvo. And that's because uh, I was fed up of fake sports cars. So I think um, if... And we, we also have in the studio that Dallara. So once we had that, if you really want to... Uh, it was part of the collaboration that we, that we got one because when we were negotiating on the project, they wanted to lower the price. They said, yes, but then you give us a car. So that's why we have that car. Um, and that is, that's real sports. That's real performance. You know, and, and to do it, really, you have to go on a track, of course. You shouldn't race in the street. And once you have that, then I didn't want to kind of fake sporty thing. So I just said, well, let's go really for the family car. A little bit in that idea that trying to have each vehicle more for its specific use. So 
with the Lara sometimes with the whole studio we go have a day fun on the on the track and that's a similar way as horses are still entertainment in a way um, bicycle inside the city station wagon for uh, the uh, bigger traveling with the family and then uh, of course also train car sharing all the things and of course I try to use kind of everything and, uh, and in a garage I still have uh, two old timers that I restored when I was 14 but that's just pure nostalgia <laughs> fantastic thank you Hi, Louis. Thanks for the presentation. It was very inspiring about movement as a whole. Um, I wanted to pick up on how you listen and your statement that we should move away from the object uh, in thinking about mobility. With the controversial object of the supercar, how do you incorporate these ideas of uh, sustainability and efficiency? And one of the examples we picked up in a conversation about your lecture was with the design of the 458, where traditionally the Ferraris would be a complete redesign, um, almost like a reinvention or like a way as the 458 then progressed and was almost updated and then to the, to the F8. Um, yep. Was that with the intuition of creating some sort of timelessness or sort of sustainable vision for Ferrari? Um, it comes more often easily connected with when something is expressing universal uh, values. What happens in uh, not just with the, with the Ferrari, so if the 458 and the versions after, but also if you look honestly with all the cars, and you can see it even more with the airplanes, is that when you want to raise the performance and means that you have to deal better with the forces of nature, which are often um, in a big part the air, which is, stays the same, doesn't change from one year to the other. So it means that when you improve performance, you, you tend to go to a certain uh, uh, point. So uh, a, a lot of comes from that every Ferrari new one is performing better than the previous one. That's not just a more powerful engine. That's just everything. So it means also that uh, what's really good you, you keep and, uh, and uh, you go on. And uh, about those thousand things together, that's uh, true for the emotional experience. So sometimes you can have stand in the front. When we design, we make full-scale models. Yeah. You know? And uh, it can be that it, it, it doesn't, doesn't speak. You don't, you don't feel it in your stomach. And by working on, on the lines, putting the, the tensions a bit uh, different. If you have a tension line over a front wheel, if you put the tension point behind the wheel, you will have a certain character. If you put it in front of the wheel, you have a different character. All those things together can make that it becomes alive. I think same must be in music, that maybe you, you record it and it doesn't speak, and then you work on lots of details and suddenly it pops. And, um, and that matters not just for the emotional response, but also for uh, also for the performance. So, and uh, and I, I didn't want to intend to say that we shouldn't think about objects anymore. Yeah. Um, what I intend to say is that when we look for moving forward, that we shouldn't start from the object. Yeah. I think uh, elements like styling remain in the future as important as today because they influence the emotional thing but it's not the only thing and it should not be our our end point it, it's a means that you can use to to create a certain uh, experience so in no way uh, i think what i told is meaning that we should do uh, take less care of the design of the object than we do today. To the contrary, that will, you know, that attention will, will stay and needs to stay. But it's just that when you think about new solutions, that it should not be your starting point. Because then you can't see anymore. That's my point. And maybe it doesn't look like it, but for example, that moving bus stop, in a way, it's designed with, with that same attention, like redoing a section 10 times until it expresses a certain lightness and so forth. So that's 
is the part, as I said, I learned really in Pininfarina, and it for me stays important in all the things uh, that you do, even though um, you know, on the eye, of course, maybe it doesn't immediately look like that because it's square or, or whatever, but it's the sensibility with which you do things, that I think should always be high at on no matter which object you or service you work on. Thank you very much. Is more focused towards um, a, a few things you pointed out, which are the idea of providing individual solutions to specific contexts. And if we combine this, for example, with the idea of ride sharing, how do you see, um, do you speculate the disappearance of the private car in a future? Like if we, if we combine the idea of ride sharing and having multiple solutions for every context we're in, do you speculate we will ever, the, the private car will ever disappear? When we think about mobility in the future, we should not think in a kind of one solution for all or kind of ec uh, extrapolate one trend and becoming everything. I think the, the right solution is, say, is to have really a multitude of things and uh, by adapting them better to the context, they can also perform better both for the experience that you have, but also from a sustainable point of view. Now, in that broad spectrum with many different needs, I think ownership of a car will still be there. If you think about uh, many, many people, especially a country like Italy, live in some uh, mountain road in a small uh, village, there's no critical mass there to do a sharing system. You know, sharing systems work when there's a certain critical mass. That's why you will see a lot, a lot of the articles and trends about mobility are often in, in cities. But even if cities are growing and even if 50% is living in cities, that also means that 50% is not living there, which are, you know, which are equally uh, served. And so I think we always need to uh, see that the big spectrum and, uh, and that's why I don't like these, these scenarios where you suddenly see these movies where all the cars go, go autonomous. I don't think that's the right the direction. I think we went too far in that, having one solution for, for everything. I think now is the time to, for diversity. And uh, we're not going in details. Now I know also that the uh, technology is allowing that. You see it. It's enough to see how many startups there are in, uh, for new types of vehicles that didn't happen just 10 years ago. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Heng. So, with, the, with mobility, and I think in the architecture uh, discipline, we mentioned this term infrastructure a lot. And I wonder, what do you think about infrastructure, both in terms of our vehicle design, and also in terms about uh, improving the mobility in our living environment. Uh, How by using these new types of vehicle that can help people in, or, or, or uh, make people in Liege uh, move around or, or uh, yeah, move in a, a bigger Complex. area of space. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of think that requires some some kind of uh, infrastructure to, to, to make it happen. So I, I wonder what do you think about it when you designing, you and your studio trying to design okay. a, a new vehicle or, or uh, think about this new system of uh, yeah. moving. Um, but I do think that um, if you n all the solutions I have shown are very light on the infrastructural needs. So those mobics don't need additional infrastructure. They don't need even charging infrastructure. They need nothing. You can just drop and they go. That uh, cyclomatic, which is a, is a concept, uh, used actually in for big parts, even the old rails. And I think it's important that we try to find solutions that are not too much infrastructure dependent for two reasons. 
One today, um, it's very hard to realize projects which need huge investments on the infrastructural side, a metro, for example. But the second thing is that infrastructure is extremely static. So if you put a, a rail track uh, today, it will still be there in 40 years uh, uh, from now. So I think uh, Technology today is not only enabling to think about different types of uh, vehicles, but is also enabling to do with less infrastructure. And that, I think, should improve the flexibility of the service. For example, instead of uh, one of that project I showed, is instead of a tram, there's going to be now a dedicated lane, so you still have good speed, but there was a, a, a soccer station, and that vehicle that goes on there only on the Sundays can pass to the station. So there's a flexibility if you're not too much dependent on, on, uh, on infrastructure. And, uh, and I think it's an important thing to look at. And that's why when I look on, on internet, there's a lot of solutions which in a way are fake solutions. Because you, when you look at mobility solutions, Always ask yourself, you know, what's first, the chicken or the egg? You know, if, if there's a system that needs a big infrastructure, so what will go first? Will you first spend all that money on the infrastructure, hoping that people will use or buy vehicles that will go? Or you wait until many people buy or use a vehicle, but they can't use it if there's not infrastructure? And that's why I think in, um, in mobility design, it's not easy, but it's relatively more simple to find, define a desired end game. But the real test sits in the transition design. It, literally designing the trajectory between today and that end game. If you don't do that, you will often not realizing that you do solutions which in a way are not solutions. And uh, that's why, if you go back to your question about the relation with infrastructure, we really try to do things which, let's say, are light on the, on the inf infrastructure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I got really curious about the Coma project. I know you said you, don't, you cannot talk about a lot, but um, my question is, um, related to in how, once the project is developed, in yes. how long it, you, th you think it would be uh, fully implemented? Okay. And uh, also following that question, um, I also uh, got the idea that it would be a project that could benefit uh, a lot of in developing countries. And I would be curious to see how do you see that happening, if you see that happening somehow. Thank you. Okay, so first question is, so it's an electric vehicle, two-seater as well. You can just buy one and, and, and use it and really have the double benefit of it. First, a better user experience compared to a car. If you think about cities like uh, Shanghai, London, Paris, you know, they're just completely stuck. If you land in the Paris and you, you need to be in a meeting, nobody takes a normal taxi. Everybody takes a motorcycle taxi. So there was a comment on ride sharing. It's, by the way, a vehicle which is really thought for ride sharing. Um, so even if you just buy one, it really makes sense. So it, the, the transition can start. You can just start selling. And then parallel to, to that, if enough people use it, then you can start working on making certain parts maybe uh, uh, adapt the infrastructure. But, but again, there you can start with a very light touch. This vehicle is not like a Twizy, you know, the Twizy, the Renault thing. The Renault vehicle is wider, so you need to behave like a car anyhow. So you have the benefits of the, of the sustainability, but not the benefit of... of uh, not a real benefit of your experience. The comma is due to the tilting system so narrow that you could simply p 
paint a line in the middle of a car lane, and you suddenly would have two lanes for vehicles like that. So it's a low threshold to start to ad adapt the structure. Maybe in the beginning, just a certain stretch. So that's stimulating maybe a couple of people more to, to use one or share one or buy one. And of course, it's a, a best case scenario, but there is a feasible scenario to get up to the point, uh, was that image, where you could say, okay, certain uh, parts, we do actually an infrastructural change for uh, the better. So, um, uh, it, it's an example of me of how important it is that the moment you speak about uh, improvements on the bigger scale, that you check that you can, can get there. And uh, uh, because, of course, policy, I didn't mention it, but is a huge part of this. You know? uh, designing policies is, uh, should be a huge part of the things. And talking about cementing the past and the future, it's strange how many of the vehicles we design and come up with, we can't do, not because technologically you can't make them, because the law doesn't, the law doesn't allow it, because the law is divided in categories based on the, on the past. Second part of the question was... <laughs> uh, um, I think the question is like, if you see uh, the project... Oh, yes. Um, um, I think uh, in the beginning, no. In the beginning, no, because um, the price of a vehicle is mostly defined by how many you make of them. Yeah? So, if you look at cars, it's like that in car world you only have Ikeas. Right? Ikea, you, you don't buy, you don't pay so much. Also because whatever they make, they make it in huge, huge scale. Um, so, if you do a new product, of course, from day one, you won't have a million sales. That means that all the investment, and that's, I think, a big difference with architecture. In, uh, for cars and products, you need huge investments for molds, factories, and so forth. That investment is basically the same if you produce 10,000 or 100,000. So if you only sell 10,000, you will need to divide those investment costs on 10,000 vehicles. So the vehicles will be more expensive. So that's why you need to, you can get there. It has that potential because it's very simple and so forth. But that will only be possible if you first sell enough of them, in, let's say in the richer parts of the world, which allow us to drop uh, cost and then you can expand also to in, uh, in other markets. And that's the reason why if you see innovative projects, don't judge too fast the price of it. It's, it's, there's no uh, choice uh, for that. So also the light year, for example, it's an expensive car, but not because we put gold in it or something. It's because it starts, of course, with a limited uh, production. Thank you. We have time for one last question. It's actually inspiring because we have in the past two weeks been designing around the car and now it's really interesting to see someone talking about designing from the car. Um, and in that relation, uh, also in relation to the project, uh, the first one, I think it was Mob Mobjects. Yes. Uh, where the where basically the car becomes a piece of architecture or the other way around, uh, but it was all happening in the public sphere. Uh, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about um, moving cars or things becoming a part of the private sphere, so in the sense of within the house. Yes, um, partially yes. We already more and more like a living space. Um, so uh, it means it becomes part of your living, but not literally part of your house. Um, it will become part of your house in, from an energetic point of view. So um, a battery in a car can power 35 houses. 
Uh, it's an enormous amount of energy that sits in there. So the car will become a very important element in the energy distribution. You know, because you can, it will not be easy to get charging points everywhere. Again, in the city you have critical mass. But maybe you charge there, and then you can go outside. So from an energetic point of view, it will become part of it. So cars will not just take energy from the home that you charge with, but also the other way around. If you look at uh, the Lucid Air, which is just being launched, is a, is a car who's doing that. So the, the car can give energy to your uh, house, um, which is interesting because maybe you have solar cells and you can't fully do it and so forth. What I don't believe so much in is, uh, and I don't know if you allude to that, is it becoming a physical part of it. So sometimes you see projects where people design like a block, you know, and you, you attach it to your home and it becomes part of your home. I think that's a little bit a too kind of naive connection uh, between the two, where in my feeling it's the opposite of what I mentioned in doing things more specific so they're really good at what they need to do. I think a house needs to be very good at being a house and a car needs to be very good at being a car. Only in that way we'll have um, an improvement, again, an experience and blah, blah, blah. If you do a, a car like a square, that's okay if you don't go faster than 50. Because above 50, the air really starts to, starts to count. And there's another aspect is that cars are subject to rather quick, uh, quick change. Houses less, so you have different frequencies. Uh, you, um, I think you can see it a bit. Sometimes you have this architecture that really integrated technology, but they they quickly become outdated. Uh, in the same way that when you enter in a car, you see the age on the car basically on the graphics of the screen more than in the shapes. So I'm not a fan of literally uh, connecting to each other. Um, typologies which are subject to different frequencies of uh, of renewal and, uh, and and change. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Lowy. Uh, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.